Good morning. On behalf of our First Baptist Church family here in Simcoe, I want to welcome you to uh, worship online this virtual uh, service. Uh, we hope that you are having a safe but enjoyable weekend with your family and friends as much as we can do in this particular pandemic. I want to open our service today with a word of prayer. Please join me. O oh God of heaven, we thank you for the earth that receives our plantings and for the sun and rain that brings them to glorious flower. Lord of life, we thank you for the people who reap this harvest and turn it into food for our bodies. Spirit of love, we thank you for our communion with you which kindles our joy in creation and stirs our affections for one another. Come, we pray, into our presence now, that we might commune with you and you with us. Let us be called to worship. Hear the song God sings to the people. A love song greets our happy ears. The people of God are the Lord's pleasant planting. The hand of the Lord stretches near the vine. O oh, earth, sing a song, throw your head back and sing. The, the keeper who tends you shall hear you and come. This is the time of year when we gather with family and friends and reflect on our blessings and share in fellowship and comfort food. And although this Thanksgiving looks a little different and we might be focusing on the people we can't share it with or the events that have been canceled, Remember that God never cancels on us. He's always with us. And each day that we live, each breath that we breathe, we do so because of him and his love. Let us praise him in thanksgiving. Our scripture reading is from Psalms 19. 
The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Our litany for today. In the morning, God plants the roots of the trees. In the evening, the Lord inspects the harvest. The planting is good. May the reaping be so. The Lord looks for justice. Let us not give God bloodshed, spilling like wine down great ancient mountains. The Lord looks for righteousness. Let us not hurl a cry in the face of our God. The Lord longs for righteousness. Let us satisfy God's longing as God grants us mercy. The planting was good. May the reaping be so. While we can't sing together as a congregation, feel the song in your heart and tap your toes. Uh, this is a great toe-tapping song, and if you're at home, sing it out. It's good to praise the Lord.
Our next hymn is All Creatures of Our God and King. And it's amazing how all creatures know how to give praise and thanks to God and just how they were made. But we have a choice. God has given us a choice that we can give him praise and thanksgiving. And this song talks about many situations we can see and know that we can thank the Lord. Thanksgiving to you, although it seems our Thanksgiving this year is a little bit different than other years. This presentation of this week's sermon is available to anyone who would like to view it, uh, particularly those of our congregation who cannot or prefer not to come to be to the uh, uh, live service on Sunday. But I do hope you get some turkey and some dressing and Maybe some pumpkin pie, too. Our scripture reading for today, our New Testament lesson, is from Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 1 and going to verse 9. This is what Paul writes. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown Stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Eudea and I urge Syntychia to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose, name, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, 
whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. I've entitled this week's message, Giving Thanks in All Things. Really? A foursome of senior golfers hit the course with waning enthusiasm for the sport. These fairways seem to be getting longer and longer, one of the foursome said. And these hills are getting steeper as the years go by, another complained. The sand traps seem to be bigger, and I remember them being much smaller, said the third senior. After hearing enough from his three friends, the oldest and the wisest of the four, who was 87 years old, piped up and said, Oh, my friends, just be thankful we're on this side of the grass. The most important attitude that we will ever nurture, that we will ever exhibit in our lives, is the attitude of thanksgiving or gratitude. However, that being said, I may be convicted by Scripture, by this fact, this need for thanksgiving, but given our current circumstances amid this pandemic, I'm finding that thankfulness or gratitude is not easy to cultivate. All of us have been hard-pressed to feel very thankful on this special holiday. To keep us safe, we've had to make some difficult choices and sacrifices, like foregoing our annual big family feast. It's just not the same seeing loved ones on Zoom as it is breaking bread together around a big table. However, everything we know and our own experience tells us that the attitude of thanksgiving makes a significant difference in our state of mind and in our attitude. And personally, this year has been a traumatic and difficult one. Many days I personally have spent in uncertainty and fear. So when so <coughs> excuse me, when someone says to give thanks in all things, even if it's the Apostle Paul, I reply, really? How can you suggest such a thing, Paul? When you yourself, as you write this, are in prison, and not just any prison either, it's a Roman prison. I don't know if you know much about Roman prisons in Paul's day, but these prisons were little more than underground caves that were accessible by a manhole-sized entrance at the top. These horrible places were dark, they were very damp, and they were very crowded. It was actually so dark in this particular prison, that's probably why Paul had to dictate this letter, because he just couldn't see well enough to write himself. Still in this miserable place, Paul in his letter to the Philippians says, Make your petitions known. Pray to God for what concerns you, what troubles you, what you desire, but in everything give thanks. Now, left to our own devices, being thankful and offering thanks to God in all things is impossible. However, if we are able, by the grace of God, to cultivate an attitude of thanksgiving in whatever what we do, say, and are all about, Paul is telling us that we will know a life that is once at once more challenging and more fulfilling. This call to thanksgiving in all things does not permit twisting our words to appear thankful when we are not. I saw a cartoon not that long ago about a family that was gathered around the dinner table and the father said to the mother, I don't want to complain about leftovers, but haven't we already said grace over this meal three times? He said he didn't want to complain, but he was complaining He wanted to give thanks in all things, but he found that a little bit difficult to do, even with just leftovers. 
That's the great challenge before us today and frankly every day. But it's also an opportunity to give, or we have, to give thanks in all things. Maybe to help us, we need to categorize our thankfulness. First, we may want to give thanks in all things obvious. What does that mean? All of us know that there are good things in our lives, so close to us, so close to home, that we forget to give thanks for them. They're obvious. We would say we take them for granted. All of us know of what kinds of things I speak. Instead of being thankful for the routine gestures of care from our spouses, our parents, and others, we grow simply to expect them. No wonder when our children are given something from us, we exhort our little ones, now what do you say? Or when they pester us for a cookie or something else, we say, what's the magic word? I've never been really a fan of that last one. So Paul begins his letter by saying, at every remembrance of you, or every time I think of you, I give thanks for you. The next time you recognize the following thought in your mind or hear it said out loud, please stop and take notice. People often say it goes without saying. When it comes to thanksgiving or gratitude, it does not go without saying. Do you remember that incredible story about the ten lepers who were healed by Jesus? And nine of them went on their own way, and only one came back. The one person who was a Samaritan knew that it doesn't go without saying. The first opportunity of giving thanks in all things, and thus changing our attitudes and our lives, is to give thanks for the obvious things. These are the people and other blessings so close to us that often we just look right past them. Several of us were raised in our lives in very stoic circumstances where we were encouraged to hide our emotions. Big boys don't cry, we were told. Some of us know people who struggle or refuse to express their feelings freely. There's an old story about a farmer who loved his wife and appreciated her so much but was rather stoic with his feelings who said that one day he almost told her how much he appreciated her. Almost is how we often attempt thankfulness, isn't it? That's the way we are sometimes. It's so obvious that we forget to give thanks. The psalmist says we are to give thanks for God's benefits. Now think for a moment of the benefits of being right here, right now. I'm not necessarily talking about being in the building, but just simply being alive. As human beings who are alive, we can laugh, we can sing, we can cry. These benefits are a part of God's wonderful love for us. One of the greatest benefits of being fully alive is to give thanks to God for all his benefits. So what benefits go unnoticed in your life? Because they are too obvious. As we know, many children, it would be interesting to ask, Have you ever given thanks for the wonderful body that you have? A great architect said that there's been no invention like the human body. Think about this for a second. Children of all ages, have you ever thought about your noses lately? Suppose that your nose was on upside down. Every time you sneeze, you blow your hat off. (laughs) And if your nose was upside down and it was raining you drown. Now, I know that sounds silly, but you know what I think is sillier? Forgetting to give thanks to God who created this marvelous miracle called our bodies. The Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and we are. Although we are wonderfully made, we're too small to cling to all the thankfulness that wells up in us. When we want to thank God, it just seems to spill over and we begin thanking thanking other people that God has placed in our lives. When we are truly thankful to God, we begin to thank people for what they have meant to us. 
We write a note. We make a phone call. We stop a person in their busy schedule and say, you know, I really appreciate you. Thanksgiving, gratitude, it's not just about this particular weekend in the year that changes hearts. It's something that we should be doing every day. We are to give thanks in all things obvious. We might also be encouraging each other to give thanks in all things obscure. Obscure? What does that mean? It means blessings and opportunities that are hidden to us. People that we don't see right away. Things that seem of little value until we take a much closer look at them. In the passage, Paul says, whatever is true, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report or gracious, think on these things. It means to calculate. It means to stop and ponder. Think of them for a a while and you begin to see that these obscure things go beyond our casual seeing. Give thanks for those things that are true. That word is a wonderful word, isn't it? It means not only what is true in terms of truth-telling or honest speaking, but also those things that are solid and have lasting substance. It's not what flits away. It's not something that's here today and gone tomorrow, but the enduring things. To give thanks for friendships that just don't blow away during tough times. It's time to give thanks for a marriage that has seen for better and for worse. At a conference some years ago where the president of Princeton Seminary was the speaker, his daughter came to him one day and said this, I've looked around and there just aren't any good marriages. I'm so discouraged. I don't want to be married. I've heard that many times, and I must admit that I, cannot, I, I can see how people would think that's true. But the president's response, the president of Princeton's response was this. He said, I tell you one marriage that's good. It's the marriage of your mother and I. And she said, oh, that doesn't count. And he said, it counts. And that's what I want to say, it counts. It counts to give thanks for those things that are true and those things that endure. Paul says, whatever things are lovely, think on those things. This suggests that whatever people, whenever people are lovable and amiable, give thanks for them. There's a famous psychologist who talks about people being noxious people, and I think we understand that. There are people who seem to make us sick because they're always so negative and pointing out our foibles to us. They tell us point blank about our inconsistency and the things we've done wrong. But he says they're also around us nourishing people. Give thanks for those who nourish you, who who feed you, who are part of God's gracious plan to encourage you and build you up. Whatever things are of good report, whatever things are valuable, give thanks for them. Even though you can't see their value at first, meditate, calculate, reckon, think on them, and their value will become much clearer. Even in those things that are obscure, then, give thanks. The last one is the hardest of all. In all things objectionable, give thanks. I deliberately saved the toughest one for last, and you all know it. In all things objectionable, give thanks. This is the one for which we have the most difficulty. This has certainly been true for myself this past year. It's hard to be thankful when you're ravaged by a nasty infection in a hospital bed and undergoing major surgery. How do you give thanks for that? Paul says that we're to give thanks in all things. Not some things, but all things. Not just the pleasant and the good, but the bad and the difficult as well. 
do you mean to say I am to give thanks for this tough patch, this rough period of my life that I'm going through? Am I supposed to give thanks for that thorn in the flesh that just doesn't seem to be taken away from me? It's a tough one, isn't it? But if we are to have an attitude of thankfulness that can transform the situation in our lives that's difficult, we are to give thanks in all things, even if it's objectionable. Quite naturally, you may say, I'm not going to give thanks for this illness. I'm not going to give thanks for what this person has done to me. Then at least start here. Give thanks for the presence of God's presence in the situation. God has not left you, no matter how difficult your life is. Even though you've got a setback in your life, life, God is still present. He's still there wanting to redeem the situation. Then there's the next step, isn't there? Begin to realize that even though it is one of the worst situations you are in, God can still work in it. Isn't the risen living Christ the great reminder that even the evil of the cross at Calvary can be transformed into the exalted life? I remember one of my favorite stories from Corey Ten Boom, who wrote The Hiding Place. It was a book I read many years ago, and, and it really touched me deeply. It's a story maybe you're quite familiar with. She died after many years, Cory Ten Boom, of serving the Lord, of going around and speaking about her experiences in a Nazi concentration camp. She was a remarkable and gracious lady. She and her family lived through the Nazi Holocaust, and they, hid, they got that way into the concentration camp because they hid some Jewish people in their home who otherwise would have been killed. Their act of compassion for their Jewish neighbors landed them in jail and eventually the concentration camp. When Corey was in a Nazi prison camp, it was such a flea-ridden, terrible place that she couldn't stand it. She would rather die. Her older sister, Betsy, who was very wise, but I found something in the Bible that can help us, she said one day. It says, in all things give thanks. Corey said, I can't give thanks for these terrible fleas. Give thanks, Betsy said, for the fact that we're together. Most families have been split up. And Corey thought, oh, I, I can do that. Her sister continued, give thanks that somehow the guards didn't check our belongings when they brought us in and our Bible is with us. Well, Corey could give thanks for that. But Corey could not even think of giving thanks for the terrible fleas. Later, they found out together that the only reason they had not been molested or harmed by the guards looking over them was because their captors were so repulsed by the flea infestation that they would not go into the barracks. Give thanks for even those lowly creatures. You know, in the town of Enterprise, Alabama, there's a monument right in the middle of the town. Now, you might think that it's to a Confederate general, but it's not. It's a monument, to, of all things, to a bull weevil, an insect. It's an animal, and it's nasty, destructive to cotton, which they grow a lot of around Enterprise. That town depended on cotton, In 1915, the bull weevil destroyed their livelihood. It wiped the crop out. But through that terrible situation, they learned the importance of diversifying the farming around them. And so they learned to plant peanuts and corn and other crops to rotate their produce. And two years later, they erected a monument to the bull weevil in the very center of their town to remind them of that terrible event to remind them that good things came to their town because of the bull wheel. The Old Testament patriarch Joseph said to his brothers who had sold him into slavery and would have killed him, you meant this for evil, but God has meant it for good. That was his monument to the power 
of God to bring good out of an apparent evil. Another story for our teachers among us. When Mrs. Klein told her first grade students to draw a picture of something for which they are thankful for, she thought how these little children who live really in a a difficult neighborhood, a deteriorating neighborhood, wondered if they could even come up with things to be thankful for. She guessed that she would receive pictures of turkeys or a bountiful laden Thanksgiving table. That was what she believed was going to come to her desk. What took Mrs. Klein by surprise was Douglas's picture. Douglas, as a kid, was so forlorn and likely found to be very close to her in her shadow even as they went out for recess. Douglas's drawing was simply this. It was a hand. Obviously it was a hand, but whose hand? The class became sort of captivated by this image and began to speculate as to whose hand it was. I think it must be the hand of God that brings us food, one student said. It's the hand of a farmer who uh, grows the turkeys that we enjoy, said another. It looks more like a policeman's hand as they protect us. I think, said Lavinia, who was always so serious in the class, that it's supposed to be all the hands that help us. But Douglas could only have time to draw one. Mrs. Klein had almost forgotten Douglas in her pleasure in finding the class so responsive to that picture. When she had all the others get on to another project, she bent over Douglas's desk and asked, Whose hand is that? And Douglas mumbled, It's yours, teacher. And then Mrs. Klein recalled that she had taken Douglas by the hand from time to time. She often did that with the children, but that it should have meant so much to Douglas to have that hand to hold. I want to tell you today that you have a hand reaching down to you. God can use even the worst of our circumstances in this fallen world to bring the best to us. You know why we can believe that? Because God certainly did not want his son to die on the cross, but when it became necessary, the despised instrument of death became the way we could know the extreme measures God's love comes to us. The cross became the means by which we can give thanks in all things, things that are obvious, things that are obscure, even things that are objectionable. In everything, therefore, my friends, give thanks. Please join me in a time of prayer. Wondrously and creative God, we marvel at your handiwork that's all around us. The sights, the sounds, the smells, they all seem absolutely endless, especially at this time of year as we mark the time of harvest. How can we be anything but thankful? What is also true, O God, is our need to be a thankful people. It's overwhelmingly tempting to to think that we as individuals, or we even as a collective, are responsible for the flow of bounty and goodness. We may have tilled the ground, we may have planted the seed, or earned the money to buy the groceries, but it was you who made the rain and the sun and the soil that makes all things grow. We need to be a thankful people, dear God, because of the temptation before us to think we are somehow separate from the rest of creation. That what happens to the water, air, and soil has little impact on us. But we are seeing more and more that this just isn't true. From issues of global warming causing terrible storms and drought to water and air poisoned and causing disease, we are intimately connected to the planet. There is nowhere else for us to go. So forgive us, O God, for neglecting our work as stewards of your creation, for shirking even the simplest things we can do to preserve and protect and enhance the part of the world in which we live. 
How rare it is today to experience any kind of pristine wilderness, let alone a trash-free park or roadside. We thank you for those brave scientists and environmentalists who try to speak prophetically to our abuse and neglect of our planet. We may not always approve of their methods, but their message is usually right on. It saddens us to learn of entire species in danger of going extinct. And we beseech you to compel our political leaders to take the necessary steps to preserve, protect, and enhance fragile ecosystems. We need a responsible balance between economics and responsible stewardship. And we fear we are unable to find that balance. But you can lead us back to where we need to be. We are also thankful today, O God, for your creation of people. Without relationships, life would have no meaning. And as we learn to love each other, we discover more and more of what it means to love you. And knowing each other, we know you. So along with preserving water, soil, and air, and the many animals around us, we pray that we might also preserve each other. That we work hard to bring opportunities for those of us to dwell in abundant living. Help us not to pollute someone else's life with the toxicity of prejudice and indifference and judgment. Instead, help us to sow seeds of generosity and mercy and grace into every life we encounter. Father, with all of this in mind, we once again find ourselves overwhelmed by what's happening in our communities. The pandemic has ruined so many lives, not just because of the illness, but the consequences of the illness. Some have taken to using illicit drugs, causing a spike in overdoses. Some relationships have really been strained. In fact, the divorce rate has been increasing rapidly. And the anxiety of everyone is so heightened. Oh God, we need peace. We need to have your reassurance that even in the midst of this terrible pandemic, You have a plan, and you have a purpose for our lives. So, Father, we pray that the pandemic will end very soon, and that whatever normal is for us, we will once again stand there. Thank you, Father, for allowing us this rare opportunity these days to worship. And for those who come on Sunday morning, we... We pray that they will be blessed in a unique and powerful way. But for those listening today, whatever is on their hearts, O God, please respond to them as only you can. Help them to see your love in all things. And so, Father, we offer our prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our last song is O Praise the Name. And it tells the story of what Jesus has done for us. So while we are meditating on these words, let us give thanks through the praise that we have for Jesus.
benediction I say these words to you go into the world as God's distinctive people love in all sincerity serve the Lord with unflagging energy stand firm in time of trouble persist in prayer and practice hospitality contribute to the needs of God's people offer blessings upon them who are persecuting you and care as much as you can for each other as you do for yourself. And may God's Spirit grant you the power to fulfill this commission to the glory of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you for listening, and may God continually bless you.